All right, we're, we're switching gears. We're still in this second level of the complexity bullseye, finite state machine CFLs. And now we're going to talk about the equivalent machine version to context-free grammars. And they are non-deterministic pushdown machines. And I'm going to tell you just what they are. We're going to do examples. We're going to try to distinguish between what they can do and what deterministic pushdown machines can do. And we'll talk about the structure and the applications of all these things today. OK, questions? Everybody all right? So again, we're gonna, you guys are going to be involved in about one minute. A pushdown machine is just like a finite state machine, except we put in an extra piece of power. We put in a stack. And the finite state machine, instead of just being able to move from state to state, can also, every time it sees a symbol, manipulate the stack in the way that you're used to. It can push a symbol on the stack and or pop a symbol off the stack. Right? So every single step it moves, it moves a state, and then it also manipulates the stack. Right? That's it. That's what it can do. So if you want to make a picture of such a thing, just a little abstract picture, and then you can put it on some textbook that you write instead of that Leonardo da Vinci thing. Uh, the finite state machine would be here. Here's the input where every cell holds another symbol. And this arrow represents that the finite state machine is always looking at some particular cell. And it always moves uniformly left to right, step by step. It doesn't have the power to go back and forth. I mentioned that a finite state machine that does have the power to go back and forth, that actually doesn't give you any more power. In this version, we're sticking with the unidirectional movement and uniform movement of the uh, machine. But I should mention that if you do allow two-way movement on a pushdown machine with a stack, then you can do more things than you can without the two-way movement. So in this case, we have to be careful to just imagine that we're moving left to right. We can't go back and look again. OK, finite state machines, it doesn't help. But here, it would help. OK, now, not only can this finite state machine look and read input, but it also manipulates a stack, which we'll keep here and we'll make a little bit bigger just to distinguish it from the input tape. And the stack has symbols in it. And that's the top. So it can pull things off and put things in. And that's what this machine looks like abstractly. When we're going to write a program to do machines like this, we are not going to write it the way that, that, that you see it in some books is they just actually list the transition function. And it's, it's quite mathematical looking and not so intuitive. We're just going to expand on the notation we use for finite state machines and add in the stack manipulations in that notation. So it looks very much like what you've been doing up till now, except with extra things on the arrows. If you define it formally, it's the same five tuple that a finite state machine was, but there's an extra two things. So it ends up being a seven tuple. The extra two things, or an extra one thing, I suppose, the extra one thing is the stack alphabet, because you need to decide what kind of symbols you're putting in the stack. And the transition function is no longer as simple as it was, just going from a state and a symbol to a state. Now it goes from a state and a symbol and the top of a stack and a stack symbol to a state and a stack symbol. So everything's a little more complicated formally, but intuitively it won't be so bad. So let's start with some specifics. Let's take a language that we know is not a finite state that has no finite state machine, that's not regular. And let's try to build a pushdown machine for it. Let's first do it intuitively to make sure we know how we could use the stack to help us here. And then we'll actually write the machine out so you'll see your first machine. So who's got an idea? How do you accept things like this? You only have a finite number of states. And depending on what state you're in, you're allowed to manipulate the stack depending on what symbol you see. So let's think of an idea before we write it out. OK, so read a zero. Read the, read the thing off to right. If you see a zero, we'll push something on the stack. Say an x will be for a zero. All right, so we, we're putting x's on the stack. And then when we see a 1, we just start popping things off the stack. And if we hit the empty string, or when we hit the end of the, the, the string, the same time the stack is empty, then we know that it's OK. And if we hit anything else along the way, we just die. So like if the stack runs out and you try to pop, that's just the end. That's a crash, right. That's a non-accepting computation, right. Or if there's no arrow defined, you know, if there's a symbol on the stack that you, that 
doesn't say what to do with it, that's a crash. The same, pretty much the same as before. If there's an error that isn't defined, it's a crash and it's not accepted. So let's write a machine that does it. Here's how we'll do it. We have a start state just as we did before. And we'll indicate semantics of these states. So this will be the push state. This is the state that we're hoping to see zeros. And we're going to push things on the stack when we do. All right, so let's write it out. If we see a zero, we stay in the state and we keep pushing. If we see a zero, we stay in the state. But there's more that needs to be on that arrow. We have to say what was on the stack before and what we want the stack to look like now. So this is a matter of notation. And this is my own notation, which is kind of the way a lot of books do it nowadays. It wasn't the way people did it 10 years ago. And I don't know if our book does it precisely the way I do it, but it's close enough. What I like to do is I like to write the top of what's on the stack currently as the next symbol. Right now, the stack we imagine would be empty. And I think of Z as the empty stack. You can check if the stack's empty. Z is the, the bottom symbol in the stack. So if the stack is empty, then we're going to put an X on it. And I write that like this, XZ. So this kind of notation is a push. I'm pushing something on, on the left of, of the empty stack. Okay? Yeah, Doug? Um, in the finite state machines, a lot of times we would have like 0, 1 to mean that it was an arrow for 0. Oh, yes. Right. Is it just contextual if you know that you're in push time machines, you know to interpret it this N way? No, I think that that notation I use, 0, comma, is really bad if I intend to do this later. I shouldn't do it. I shouldn't do it. I should use plus instead of comma because I mean plus anyway. It's just that in mathematics, plus in this kind of theory area is always, always means union. And comma usually means union in math if you put curly brackets around it. So it's often used instead. But I should have been careful there and just wrote plus instead of comma because these commas are different. These commas mean three separate things. Zero combined with the empty stack, push on the empty stack, and then go back to where you were. Yeah. The three yeah, this is the symbol you're reading. Yeah. This is what the top of the stack looks like now. That's what the top of the stack looks like when you're done. Um, so Z. Z is a stack? Z, Z is a symbol that sits on the bottom of the stack. Okay. It's the empty stack. But so what happens the second time yeah. through? So I've, I've, I've done that once. I've, I have XZ. Now I get another zero. You can't use this transition the second time through because okay. there's an X on the top of the stack. Michael's right. I mean, if I just have this machine right now, it can't do any more pushing. It can only do one push. You're right. And I'd be dead, and I wouldn't accept anything. Well, I don't got any final states. I'm not accepting anything anyway yet. But, but you're right. That's a problem. We have to add in another transition. So I'll put it up here. 0, Z, X, Z, 0, X, X, X. So if you see an empty stack or you see an X, and there's a 0 as your symbol, Push an X on the stack. This just means push an X on the stack if you see a zero. Sometimes, you see how I have two things here? Sometimes, if you just want it to mean this, you would write this. Zero, anything, X, anything. Okay, whatever's on the stack, if you see a zero, stick an X on top of it. That's all this really means. I'm just being formal here and I'm writing down all the possibilities. The only symbols in our stack are going to be X and Z, the empty stack. There's always Z. That's the empty. The, the thing in the middle, is, is it just one? It's whatever's at the top of the stack? Do we look down multiple layers into the stack? All you can see is the top. The top. Yes. It's a stack, right. It's a real stack. Like those plates in the cafeteria. I think. All right, so I'm reading the zeros. I'm reading the zeros. If I ever read a one here, what happens? I need to go to a different state because I have to remember that now I'm in a popping mode. If I stay in the same state, I'd be able to push zeros on again, and I don't want to be able to do that. So if I see a 1, I pop. Sorry. If I see a 1 uh, x, I pop. Here's how we write pop. We write the top of the stack like we do before, but here we say pop. Okay? Sometimes books put an empty string there or something. But that confuses me because I always think of the empty string as being a, an input symbol, not... I just like to write pop. It's clear enough. And now we go to another state, which we'll call the pop state, because this is a state that we're doing popping from. And in this state, what should the transition be? We want to look for only ones here. And one, one x 
we're going to pop. If you see a one and there's an X on the stack, pop that X off. You're matching up the ones with the X's that represent the zeros that you pushed on before. Okay. Well, how do we finish this machine up? This machine doesn't have any accepting states. This machine doesn't do anything yet except push X's on a stack and then pop the X's off as it sees the ones. What do you do next? Okay. We need another state. That'll be the accepting state. How do we get to that state? If you, well, because almost, that's the right idea. If we saw one and it's already an empty stack, what does that mean? That means we, have, that we got too many ones. So actually a one Z should go to a dead state. Um, so it's going to be the empty string, Z, and you're allowed to do this too. You're allowed to leave the stack alone. You're allowed to do nothing. You're allowed to push, pop, and no, don't touch it. See, actually, technically, you're not allowed to leave it alone. Technically, if you want to leave something alone, you have to push something on it and then pop it off. So you just go from one state to another. I mean, technically, all you can do is push and pop, but, but it doesn't affect your ability to leave it alone. You can just add two states. So, so we might as well say you can leave it alone. So you can leave it alone, and then you, you accept. So, yeah, questions? If uh, the stack is empty, yeah, then we can't pop anything off. And the way to find out what's on there is that how do, how do we find out that it truly is empty? I mean, are, are you thinking of a particular string? And I guess I'm, I'm remembering when we uh, when, uh, when we were doing you know beta sim. Yeah, we had to like to look at something. Oh no, that was only never mind. That was just to see the one below it. We can, uh, we can see yeah, you can just look at the stack, and, and, and if there's an empty symbol on top of me, there's nothing there. Right. Just no. That's okay. Does this mean that these things basically have to be non-deterministic to be useful? Oh, what a great question. That's an <laughs> excellent question. A really excellent question. No, it's really a good question. And for finite state machines, whenever we had an, an e-move that was automatically non-deterministic, mm -hmm. right? Because it meant that you had a choice to follow the real symbol you just read wherever it tells you to go or to follow that e-move somewhere else and follow the symbol wherever it goes. And that means you had a real choice. All right. Now, in these kind of pushdown machines, the presence of an e-move does not necessarily imply that it's non-deterministic. So what does it mean to be non-deterministic? Intuitively, non-determinism means that you don't know what to do, that you have a choice. And an e-move in a finite state machine means that you have a choice. But an e-move here doesn't necessarily indicate that there's a choice because there's another piece of input that you have to combine with it before you can do anything. So on an e-move in a finite state machine, if I see nothing, I can always go down that arrow. But here, if I see nothing, I can't always go down this arrow. When can I go down this arrow? If I see nothing and... The stack is empty. I'm not allowed to go down this arrow every single time. If I see a 1 and there's an X, I can do this pop. But if I see the empty string, I can't just do this pop because I feel like it because there is no arrow empty X pop. If I put empty X pop on this loop, that would be a non-deterministic machine. Because then, seeing an X on the stack and not looking at any symbol, I could pop. Or seeing an X on the stack and seeing the one I could pop. It's two different choices. Yeah. How are we constrained from, say we had 0, 3, 1 to the 7, and we come in and we do, we pop our stack to empty, and then we just do an e-move over with the empty stack? Chris asked another good question. And this really picks on, on a technicality. But before I answer it, let me make sure everybody understands this. The definition of non-determinism for these pushdown machines is long and complex, but intuitively it's very simple. If you don't have a choice in your machine at any step, then it's deterministic. E-moves do not necessarily give you choices because they're combined with stack symbols. So if you have a unique input stack symbol for every choice, it's still deterministic. Here we have empty Z, so that's still going to be deterministic because there is no other Z combined with anything off this 
circle. If Z combined with anything else off this circle, then it would be non-deterministic. Yeah, Don, I'll, I'll get to your question in a second. You had said that <coughs> if you had a one or, or an empty X or a one Z, I forget which one you use, that it would then be non-deterministic. Yes, yeah, so if, if I put this in here, empty X pop, that's non-deterministic because when I'm sitting here and I'm staring at the ones, uh -huh. I can either read the one and pop, oh, or okay. I can just pop as many as I want without reading the one. Okay. And that gives me two completely different computations for the exact same string. I forgot how the empty worked for a second there. Okay. Um, okay. <laughs> can, are the implicit path to dead states, those are okay in a deterministic pushdown? Like you don't have to draw everything. Like right. You assume that any arrows that aren't there are dead. Right. Right, but Chris asked a really, really good question whose the answer to which requires a technicality that I really don't want to get into because it, it, it gets away from the gist of what's going on. But I do want to deal with the question because it's a good question. What if I throw in 0, 3, 1 to the 7th into this machine? What actually happens? We push through the zeros. We got three X's on the stack. We start reading the ones. We start popping ones. We pop off three ones. Now, if we do pop off another one, we're going to crash. So that doesn't work. But after popping off three of them, we can read no symbol at all. Notice that the stack is empty. Go over here and accept. So, right, so at this point, right, at this point, then we still have more symbols on. Mm -hmm. And then we'd see a one, and then it would crash. Okay, so, so it's... in in. Right. It, it's, it's similar to what you had before, but it's a little tricky because here you can kind of eat things up on the stack or, or decide when you're going to jump up. But it's still deterministic. Okay? There are some technicalities with this distinction between non-determinism and determinism that if it really bugs you, and I don't mind if you do this, if it really bugs you and you don't like this empty string and you just want to know when you get to the end of the string, use like a pound sign for, uh, imagine there's a pound sign at the end of your input string. A special, you know, terminating symbol, like a period at the end of a file or a control uh, D or whatever there is at the end of a file. Imagine that that comes at the end of your input and you're looking for it. And in that way, I could replace this epsilon with a pound sign and it would take away any of these funny issues. So that way, epsilon would be used for when you really want, you know, kind of a random choice to go out and pound sign would be used for when you hit the end. So if you want to do that and epsilon bugs you, then you can do that. But there's, there's officially no problem with using epsilon here. It's okay. So do we have to have some state going out of the accept state uh, on ones or zeros? They're all dead. Do you but have to, draw to it keep in? this deterministic, don't we have to do that? No, they're all there. I just didn't draw them. Every combination of, of 1 and 0 with x and z is there, and they all go to dead states. But if you don't draw it, that makes it non-deterministic, doesn't it? Because it doesn't have arrows going out. Technically, right, right, right. In a deterministic machine, you assume the presence of every combination of input symbol. In this case, both the input tape and the stack tape. So just for convenience, because there's a lot of those, even for deterministic machines now, if we don't draw them in, we just assume that, that whatever ones I left out are there and go to a dead state. So I could draw them in if I want to. But it doesn't make it any less deterministic in, in practice. All right, everyone... Questions about this example? This is the simple exam simplest example there is. This is the 0 to the n, 1 to the n, the one we couldn't do for finite state machines. And now that we added a stack, boom, we can do it. You can put any symbol on the stack. Yes. And in fact, the stack alphabet is as long as you want to make it. Just like you can use you know, more than zeros and ones if for your input, you can have x's and y's and z's and as many as you want. And you're supposed to specify what the stack alphabet is before you start. I should mention, actually, that if I restrict the stack alphabet to a single symbol, like if I said you couldn't use anything but an X, then you can't actually get all the non-deterministic pushdown machine power. It's not powerful enough. You have to allow a general stack alphabet. A stack with just one symbol is called a counter, because all it can do is count. Right? It can't do palindromes, for example, because it can't remember the pattern. It can only count. You need two counters to simulate a general stack. Yeah. So, so I could throw two single symbol stacks in here, and that would be the same as having one stack. So you need four counters to do a Turing machine. 
Maybe we'll do that if we have a lot of time next week. Yeah. If the stack has a language that's equivalent to the language we're using in the machine, so for example, we're using ones and zeros, which means we've got two <coughs> different plot, two different uh, symbols. Mm -hmm. The stack has two symbols. Does it have full power? I yes. Mean, if, if, and if the language only has one symbol, the mm -hmm. stack still only has one symbol. Would it still have full power? Oh, that's a good question. Um, you mean if the input alphabet is zero. is just zeros, can you still do every context-free language over zeros with just a single stack symbol? I don't know the answer. So it's, it's That's not a good question. An with the, with the language. No, no, it's got nothing to do with that. Okay. You, you need general stack symbols to have full power in, in a non-deterministic machine. If you restrict it to one symbol, you don't have full power. But but maybe for single alphabets they're equivalent and it doesn't matter. I don't know. That's a good question. I'll think about it this afternoon. That's the kind of question I just put in a quiz and then it ends up being a paper three <laughs> years later. Now, I don't know if that question is easy or hard, it, it, but it's interesting. I don't know the answer. Okay. <coughs> Questions? Do people build these machines? You mean like in their backyard and stuff? <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, can you buy a push-down machine? <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, with extra batteries. No, not really. I mean, you can simulate them. You simulate them. We, um, you know, the what Yak pretty much does is simulates the action of one of these pushdown machines, more or less. But you write a program to do this, and the program has the data structure of a stack. So you don't really, you know, have a machine that just does this. It's too simple. Uh, oh, I see. You mean like? Oh, sure. There might be microprocessors that have programs that are really push-down machines inside them. But even finite, you're not really buying finite state machines. You're buying a whole program that just happens to be simulating the finite state oh, machine. Yeah. Oh, you know, I take that back. I bet well, you I bet your traffic lights are just finite state yeah. machines without... Uh, no. Nowadays, they're probably yeah. microprocessors. <laughs> yeah, you see, I'm not... Certainly 30 years ago, there were machines that were just finite state machines. And, uh, and I'm not sure if there's actually, like, I don't know, like, yeah. No, you, you, your toaster's a push-down machine. <laughs> no, no. I didn't. That's <laughs> $3. Three bucks for the setup, yeah. <laughs> I found this finite state machine, and then somebody said, oh, if we add this, it becomes this. You mean, like, what happens first? Yeah, um, did it go that way, or is this something that was created later to build a hierarchy? I don't know which form formalization came first. Um, I'm not sure. The f all the theorems about finite state machines were done, you know, the, the basic ones were done in the 50s and then 60s, and context-free languages, same time, similar, and that's when compiler... Term machines officially before that, right, right. So I guess in some ways, you know, here's a general mode of computation, and here's, um, <laughs> and here's, uh, and let's cut it down a little bit and get these other form formalities. I don't know, Todd. Do you know you, from the linguistic point of view, which came first, uh, context-free languages or finite state machines? No, yeah, I'm not sure. I can look it up. You might think they went in order, yeah. If you're studying the brain, it's like that. You start with the brain and think of part of it out. Yeah. Yeah. Is that what you That's like that pain in the ass kid on my block. <laughs> He's well behaved now. <laughs> All I can think of is Jack Nicholson. Okay, so that's a pushdown machine example. Non-determinism is a little bit different than it was before, but more or less the same idea. And what we're going to do is one more example. This time we have to think a little bit more. It won't be quite as easy as a 0 to the n, 1 to the n. And we'll need to use more than one symbol on the stack. And we'll do it together as a group. And we'll go around the room so everyone can participate. And there'll be a little trick involved. All right, so this, this line, and then there's ice cream at the end. <laughs> this language is the language of, of uh, even length palindromes. W can be any symbol over the alphabet 0, 1. And the R here means that you're reversing W. So it's any set of symbols 
over zero and one, followed by their reverse. That's what this notation w means. Is like string, w is any string okay. here. W is an element of zero plus one star. Okay, so W is any string in, in zeros and ones, and as long as you have its reverse, that will be in our language. So these are even length palindromes. Let's write a push down machine, and in fact, let's try, if at all possible, to keep our machines deterministic. Because, well, because we'd like to if we can. <laughs> that's not very. Aesthetic yes, an aesthetic print, that's right. Um, Okay, well, it's going to be hard to keep it deterministic here. How come? How would you do this? What's an idea? Joe? Read the first part of the string when you push on the stack. Okay, uh, read the first part of the string, and by that you mean the first half, presumably. So you read the first half, and you're reading zeros and ones. As you read the zeros and ones, we can put x's and y's. You can put zeros and ones on the stack, too, whatever. You put the zeros and ones on the stack. And now that you get to the second half, you're ready to see the reverse string. And since you put the first half on the stack, what you're going to see is actually hopefully sitting on the stack in the order that you're going to see the new symbols because they're put on as a stack in reverse. So then if they match, the new symbol on the top of the stack will just pop it off and keep going. And as long as they keep matching, we're fine. And if the stack empties the second we get to the end of the string, then we say, OK. That's a good idea. But, <laughs> right, how do you know where that middle part is? How do you know where the middle part is? Can we do an arbitrary number of pushes and or pops um, for every input? Like, you get a one? Uh, officially not, but, but you can always do it anyway just by adding more states. Like, say on this state, I want to push two things on this symbol. So I go to another state, I push one. That just goes to another state, pushes the other, and that goes back in the loop. So yes, you can do it, but not, it's not part of the official rules. Okay. We really do need extra states to simulate. Uh, yeah, Joe? Is there only one stack? Yes, there's only one stack. Okay. Yeah. So here, here's what I'm going to do. Since nobody's screaming out the answer, I'm just going to make this over the alphabet 0, 1, and 2. <laughs> and I'll put a 2 in the middle. So it's a different language. It's easier to recognize now. When you see the two, then you send a message to Joe to start doing the second half. It's much easier, I know, but, but everything we do with this is going to be very similar to the way you do it without the two, so we might as well do it with the two if it makes everybody feel better. <laughs> <laughs> and then we'll fix it. And then we'll fix it. It is a good strategy to use in general. Mathematicians do this all the time. Computer scientists do this all the time. You have a really hard problem, and it just makes you uncomfortable, and you're not sure you can do it. So, But you see another problem that's really similar, and you're almost certain you can do it. So just do the one you can do, because very often, your discomfort was completely a fantasy. And when you're done doing the problem that you thought was easy, you say, oh, that first one is really the same thing, and then you're done. Not very often, but it does happen. <laughs> it does happen. It really does. So can you just have one state that pushes whatever it is you get, mm. and then a second state that pops the mm. same thing, mm -hmm. and in the middle, you it's a non-deterministic. It always goes if the state's the same. That doesn't really describe something that looks yeah, like Yeah, no. Actually, yeah, you're doing a great job. You have just the right idea, but uh, but you're, you're, in the, you're doing it without the two, and I want to do it with the two. So I'm going to have the two that goes in between. And then we'll do it your way, which is right. And it's a good idea, Michael. <laughs> Michael's smart. All right. We're going, to look, we're going to do Joe's strategy here. So we'll call this state Joe. It's really the push state. All right, it's the Joe state. And we're going to just read zeros and ones. And as we read zeros and ones, we're going to push x's and y's. You know, I, you know, gonna, I, don't, I don't want to push zeros and ones only because anybody who's not completely used to the notation yet is going to get mixed up which part of the comma is the symbol and which is the stack. And maybe none of you will, but, but I'll pretend I will. All right. Uh, I'm going to stay pushing here. If I see a zero, what do I do? I push an X. Do I care what's on the stack when I'm pushing? So I'm just going to write any. 
Okay, zero, anything, push an X. One, anything, push a Y. Okay. I'm munching up the zeros and ones. If I see a two, I shift over. Do I care what's on the stack if I see a two? What if it's the empty stack? What if I see two right at the beginning? Still want to move over, right? Because it's okay just to see a single two. So no matter what, any. What do I do with the stack here? Any. You leave it alone. Right. Officially, I should push something on it and then pop it off. I should have that extra state. But, but think of that as a shorthand for doing that double movement. So I leave it alone. And now I'm ready to go into the popping state. Or we'll call it the matching state, because that's really what it is. Matching or popping. And now as I read symbols, I will be matching them off in reverse order to the palindrome. So I'm hoping to find things like 0x zero, zero, zero pop and 1y pop. If I hit a z when I'm looking at a 1 or a 0, I'm dead, right? That's no good. If I hit a 1x, I'm dead. If I hit a 0y, I'm dead. All of those arrows that I'm not drawing in here are implied to go to a dead state. You don't draw them all in on push-down machines because there's just a lot of them. And it makes it ugly and messy. So let's assume that the ones that aren't there go to dead states. How do we finish this up and, and succeed? If you are at the end, you empty string, Z, leave it. And that means everything matched. I'm done with my string. The stack is empty. I'm ready to move over and accept. If there happens to be more symbols here, I die. Okay? Let me stop for questions about this example. This is just one step more complicated than the one before, and not all that much more complicated. But it does show you how you get palindromes now. Questions? All right. So now let's do it this way, without the two. Here's how we do it without the two. Let's think about what this means. This is really a non-deterministic machine. How come? It's because at this point, if you see a 1 or a 0, and something's on the stack, you don't know whether to do this arrow and push, or whether to ignore the 1 or 0, thinking of it as an epsilon, and switching over to this state. You have a real choice here. This represents the choice of every time you read a symbol, am I going to push it on the stack? Have I reached the halfway point? Or have I not reached it yet? You have to guess. Now, if there is a halfway point where things match up, then you can make the guess at this point and get to an accepting state. That's good. That means we definitely accept all the palindromes. We just substitute this movement where the two used to be. The issue that could go wrong here, the reason why, if you're getting a sense, well, how is that so easy? There is a subtlety that could make this not work, and that is it's possible that when you put this in, other things have a chance to get to the final state that didn't used to. Maybe non-palindromes can get there. Is there any way to get from here to here with a non-palindrome? Well, let's think about it. This state has pushed a bunch of symbols on the stack. Then let's say you decide to go over here, and you match, 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 match. The only way to get to that final state is if everything you pushed on the stack the first time matched with all the su succeeding symbols that you decided to match them with, and there's nothing left as far as the symbols go. Because when you go here, there better not be any symbols left on the, on the machine. So if you just think about what this machine does, it can't accept anything except palindromes, and it accepts all the palindromes, and it's just as easy to write it with the two in there without it, except that now we have non-determinism. So we have, to, we have to cash in on our power here. We couldn't just make it deterministic, but conceptually it wasn't a big leap. Questions? Yeah, Chris. And then. So to get all of the palindromes, not just the even length ones, we would just go E0 or 1 from that up? What do you think? Chris says, what if you wanted all the palindromes instead of just the even length ones? 
then here, instead of guessing you're at the halfway point, you would guess that you've hit the middle symbol, and that middle symbol could either be a zero or a one. So instead of having an E here, you would have, you wouldn't even have an E. Oh, you want even also. You don't just want odd. Oh, if you want even and odd, then you could have a zero here, or a one here, or an E here. And still, you would get only even or odd palindromes. Yeah, absolutely. And that would be even more non-deterministic if you want to. More choices, three choices at this point. Because you don't know whether you got the even one or the odd one, and you have to guess. Thinking of non-determinism as guessing is a good thing to do if you can would get in that, that mode. Would that No, because I think after you make the guess, you want to do the same thing afterwards. So it would look like this. It would look like this. Well, I would just add it on the same arrow. Zero, any, any, one, any, any. Just You would just add it right down. Yes, yeah, it, it, they really mean different arrows, but it's just, yeah. yeah. Uh, Neil, you had a question? Who had a question? Oh, yeah. Can you convert this into a non-deterministic No. <laughs> no. Non-deterministic pushdown machines cannot be converted, generally speaking, into deterministic machines. You can't do the same trick we did before. And the reason we can't do the same trick we did before is because before, this is a really, really important question. So I'm not just, uh, maybe I should slow down with this answer. It's a really important answer. You know what? I'm going to hold off because I'll talk about it in a minute. It's very important. It's going to be the next thing we're going to talk about, the relationship between determinism and non-determinism. You really need non-determinism here. You can't do this with a deterministic pushdown machine. There's no way to do it. You can't make that guess and get it right. You have a question, Michael? Can these machines do WW? This means all the strings whose first halves are the same as their second halves. So they can't. They're too stupid. If you had two stacks, you need two stacks? Two stacks, you could certainly do this. Right. But you can't do it with one stack. If you try the same strategy and you push the first half on the stack, then you got it in the wrong order. Could you do this with a two-way machine? A machine that can go back? Yes, you could, because it can read it backwards. Remember I told you that if you make these things two ways, you actually increase power? So that's an example of that. It sort of gives you another stack. It's not exactly. No, a, not quite another stack. Because a two-way a two-way pushdown machine is not quite as powerful as a Turing machine. Right. But it's more well. The interesting thing is a two-way deterministic machine. Let me show you a picture. Non-deterministic pushdown machine. Deterministic pushdown machine. I just told you that that making this two ways, you know, sometimes gives you more things that you couldn't do before. So a two-way non-deterministic pushdown machine you know, can do a lot, and a two-way deterministic pushdown machine can do more than a deterministic pushdown machine. But here's what it looks like. A two-way deterministic pushdown machine is bigger, but there are some things that are here. looks like this. Let me see if I can make the picture right. Uh, this is two-way deterministic machine. A two-way deterministic machine has some things that can't be done with a non-deterministic one-way machine. But there are some things that a non-deterministic one-way machine, or excuse me, there are some things, some things a two-way machine can do that non-deterministic machines can't do, and things that non-deterministic machines with one-way can do that two-way deterministic machines can't do. It's, yeah, it's, it's not just this containment thing anymore. Suddenly, it starts to spread out. Remember that picture Mike Sipser put up on the board with, with all those levels, and then they started to cross over each other, and he was at a different level. He was in the co-NP and RP and all these other classes. But, but people who do his kind of research, they live in that world of, of trying to figure out the relationship between the classes. And, and you see diagrams like this all the time. Yeah, Chris? Is it actually encompass all? Oh, yeah, it does. I should write it like this. Um, yeah, it does. That's better. You're right, right. Anyway, that's a side thing. You can like make a machine with a cube. Where a Is that a different kind of thing? No, that's an exam question. <laughs> 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 what do you think? What do you think about a cube? How many stacks can a Q simulate? Can a Q simulate a stack at all? If you wanted to do 
pushing and popping like a stack and all you had was a queue, how would you do it? Should I let you think about it for a while? It's a good question. This hierarchy, you know, zero stacks, one stack, two stacks. Is there any hierarchy with queues? Maybe when you throw one queue on, you're already up at the Turing machine stage. Maybe it's one, two, three queues. I mean, how do they relate? Are queues more powerful than stacks or less powerful? Things to think about. I'll let you think about that. We'll move on with some simpler stuff. It's a very good question. Take it off the exam, though. I, yeah. <laughs> I need, um, no, it's not on the exam. Uh, how come nobody's asking just like nice, Straightforward questions, geez. All these really, I mean, excellent questions. Really excellent. You're thinking just like, uh, just like you should be. Okay. We just did even palindromes. Now we're going to do this. We're going to do the complement of even palindromes, things that are not even palindromes. Now, I need to remind you of something very important. Context-free languages are not closed under complement. Just because we had a way of getting even length palindromes does not mean there is any way to get the complement. You can't just toggle the final and non-final states like we used to. And I want to think about that and go slow with that for a minute. Why can't you just toggle the non-final and final states for these non-deterministic pushdown machines? Why can't you just reverse everything? I mean, wherever you used to end up and accept, now you reject. And wherever you used to end up and reject, now you accept. I'll give you a hint. If it was a deterministic machine, you could do that. Deterministic machines are closed under complement. Deterministic context-free languages are closed under complement. Let me tell you what that means. If you take the complement of a deterministic context-free language, you get another deterministic context-free language. It stays there. If you take the complement of a non-deterministic context-free language, you don't necessarily get one. It goes out possibly into a higher level. So you can do the final toggling trick for deterministic context free language. It's the same trick we did for finite state machines, no more complicated. Why doesn't the trick work for non-determinism? Because it didn't work for non-determinism for finite state machines either. If you toggle states in a non-deterministic finite state machine, you don't get the complement language. You end up accepting all the places that you had a chance to reject before. And the states that you had a chance to reject are not the complement. The complement should be all the ones that always get rejected. Non-determinism doesn't complement easily. So you can't just do tricks with non-determinism by toggling states. So there's no obvious way to show that non-deterministic context of languages would be closed, and in fact, they're not. Nevertheless, in this case, we can still get the complement. Doesn't mean we're definitely stuck. This means we're not automatically in the ballpark. Before I go on and work on this, context-free languages are closed under under what operation? Not complement, but under what easy operation? Under union. Because if you have a context-free language, you can do it as a grammar and take your start symbol and point it to the two start symbols of your grammar, and that's the union of the two. You can do the same thing with machines by doing the epsilon trick at the beginning. You know, just here's the two machines. You had another machine with a new start state. Epsilon, ZZ, go to each of the machines. That's deterministic even with the epsilon? No. no. Deterministic machines are not closed under union. Context-free languages are... CFLs are the same as non-deterministic pushdown machines. Right. This means non-deterministic. This means deterministic. These are closed under union. These are closed under complement. These are not closed under union just because of what Chris said. Because the way you would normally do it is by making these E moves. And that's non-deterministic. You have a choice this way or that way. There's no way to get a general union of two deterministic context-free languages together. And in fact, here's a classic language that you can prove requires a non-deterministic pushdown machine. 
It's this deterministic one union with this deterministic one. These two together require a non-deterministic machine. There's no way to do it with a deterministic machine. And that's a counterexample to the hypothesis that they might be closed under union. They're not. Everyone knows how to do this with a deterministic machine? Anybody know how to do this with a deterministic machine? You push the zeros on, and then when you read the ones, instead of popping every time you read a one, the first one you read, you just move to another state that says, I saw one. And the next one you read, you pop. Then you go back. So you have a little double loop reading pairs of ones before you pop. It's not too bad. You can, but then, well, you could push it twice and then just pop once on the other side. Is that what you mean? You want twice as many ones as zeros. So either you're going to read two ones to match each thing on the stack, or you're going to push twice as many on the way in and then just pop one at one at a time. I don't want to get into the details of that. That is a homework question. But to do both of these requires non-determinism. You can't mix them together deterministically. So keep that in mind. Neither one of these is closed under intersection, because intersection would require two out of the three operations of union, complement, and intersection. Two out of the three. <laughs> you'd require, if you were closed under complement and union, then you'd be closed under intersection. And neither one of these is closed under both complement and union. Well, we have the TA second table for it. Uh, I can pass out a table I, for you. I actually, from when I took this before. You have a big table? It's the entire class on a sheet of paper. Ooh. We like that. Yeah. You won't want to see it to the end. <laughs> okay. I, I can make a, I, I can Xerox a, a copy of all these closure properties and, and what's there and what's not. Uh, this is actually kind of, a, it, this is kind of a, a slick trick to know this though because there is a trick when we talk about undecidability later where you go ahead and you take two context-free languages and you, and you union them. And then that's definitely context-free. And then you take their complement which ends up turning into deterministic context-free languages and, well, uh, I'm really off. I'll do it later. I want to get back to the, my mainstream here. I, I went off on a tangent and a double tangent. Let's get back to the mainstream. The complement of even-length palindromes. I want to hear some ideas. How can we make a plan for a push-down machine that's going to get this? Everything that's not of this form. You mean odd length strings are definitely in this complement. Right. All right, so let's start there. So the first thing Doug mentions is that these are even length palindromes. We want the complement of that. So anything that's odd length is in the complement. Okay? How do you do something to accept odd length things? Anything odd, even, anything, except. Make a finite state machine, right? And we'll divide all the things in this complement into the odd length strings and the even length strings. The odd length strings, I'll accept E, Z, Z. If it's odd length, I'll go this way. And if it's even length, I'll go here. Okay, so I agree that, that Doug's right. We can divide this up into the ones that are odd length and the ones that aren't odd length. The ones that are odd length, we definitely want to accept, and we'll do that with a finite state machine. You'll notice that a finite state machine is really also a pushdown machine. It just doesn't touch its stack. Just leave the stack alone the whole time. I wrote any here, so it's any, 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 any. Just don't touch the stack. Leave it alone and accept all the things that end up in the odd state. Or if it's not odd, if we don't make this non-deterministic choice and, and know that it's odd, if it's even, if we go this way, then what do we have to make sure? Is that the same machine except when you get to a point where the stack doesn't match, you go to a state where you always, an accept state you always stay in that has all the arrows? That's one way to do it. Let's try to do it that way. So, so M Michael's idea is to work on what he already knows from the last machine. And the last machine we were working with matches, right? And hoping that we guess the right halfway point. 
We'll do the same thing, but this time we'll look for a mismatch. And if we ever get a mismatch, we just die and, and go to a dead state. No, if we get no, a mismatch, we we Sorry, if we get a miss, I said it wrong. If we get a mismatch, we go to, uh, we accept. Okay, right? so let's look for mismatches. And if, a, yes? The matching, is that something you just get for free, or is, is that something that was implemented in a way that I missed? You mean checking that the symbols in the second half match the symbols in the first half? We got that because when we read the symbols in the first half, we threw uh, representations of them on the stack. And then when we read the symbols in the second half, we matched the symbols we were reading in the second half with the symbols that were on the stack. So the comparison is what the state is? The, the comparison is comparing the symbol on the input to the symbol on the stack. You'll see it again right here. We'll do it again right now. Yeah. Because the other machine is non-deterministic. No, it's going to be non-deterministic too, but it's going to be a different non-deterministic machine. If you toggle the states of a non-deterministic machine, you don't get its complement. You get something else, and and so it doesn't work. If it was, it's not going to work the same way. You can't just do the thing. It'll be a little right. We can let's see what, what let's see what happens. <coughs> let's start up. We're trying to accept things now that are even length, but do not have their first halves matching their reverse in the second half. How do we begin? So we're just going to push like we did before. So zero, any push an x, one any. Push a y. That's just what we did before. And at some point, we're going to guess that we're at the halfway point. Is that right? Seems OK. There's another way to do this, by the way. This is OK, though. But if we, if we jump early, we're going to, or jump late, we're going to be able to, uh, we will find a mismatch. So we'll have to, well, I guess we can do something with matching the. If you find a mismatch and you didn't guess the right point, then we won't accept. We'll only accept mismatches that are comparing the right symbols. And we, we can do that by hopefully counting whether the stack empties out as we hit the end. So we can do the same test to make sure we get the right mismatch. So, so we are going to push everything on like we did before. Guess one to go over here. And here, before we were looking for matches, now we're going to hope to get a mismatch. That's what's going to make us accept. We're hoping to get a mismatch. So we still don't go to an accept state. We have to go to a state that then is going to empty out the stack. Right. Yeah. If we get a mismatch, we have to check that the mismatch occurred at a point where the number of symbols that we added onto here is going to equal the number of symbols that got popped off total. In other words, that this choice was made at the halfway point. You can make guesses in, finite, in push down machines, but you often have to check those guesses were right later on. Otherwise, you allow acceptance with wrong guesses. The guesses are fine. It gives you power, but you have to check that the guess you made works out. Let's see how this works. If we get a mismatch, that means a zero, y, y pop, or a one, x, x pop. Anything else we don't accept. Anything else just gets killed, right? Well, or does it? If you get matches, does that mean you're dead? No, no yeah, right? Matches are okay. You can get lots of matches as long as you get one mismatch. Mm -hmm. So we have to allow for these matches. Zero X pop, right? Zero, whoops, one Y pop. Matches are okay. Match all you want. At some point, there's got to be a mismatch to get you to a final state. When you find that mismatch, out you go. Now, we still don't accept yet, because this mismatch could have occurred at the second symbol and the fifth symbol, and the string is 200 symbols long. It, me it meant that you picked the wrong halfway spot. So here, we're now going to check that this halfway spot is a legitimate halfway spot. And we do that by continuing to pop symbols off, hoping that we get to the end of our string at the exact same time that the stack is empty. If that's the case, then we pushed exactly half as many before we made this move as we popped. Mm -hmm. So, any say that again, Sean. Any, any, pop. Any, any pop. 
And what's good? If we hit the end of the string, Z, Z. Yes. We do need it. Because this has no way of getting to an accept state on an odd length string. The only way this can get to an accept state, and it's very important that the only way you can get there, is if you get a mismatch in an even length string. In fact, you can never ever get here on an odd length string. You only get there if there's no symbols left and the stuff you pushed was the same as the stuff you popped. And that means it has to be even length. Right? You want to try to fix it a little bit here to try to include this? Yeah. It's not so easy. And not if you could, it would make the machine, well, it might make the machine deterministic, which I'm pretty sure you can't do. So, so I'm not sure you can do any better than this. <laughs> I'm not sure you, can, you could ever put these together in one. You might be able to, but the non-determinism would be hidden somewhere in here then. And this is easier to understand anyway, I guess. What yeah. if you had the, a different string, though? This is definitely even the way you have it set up, isn't it? W, W, R, but if you had like W with one or zero, you know, with the odd, if you included odd length palindromes like we did last time where you had... E okay, so, so any two, palindromes and then I wanted the complement of that, yeah. then I just wouldn't have this part. And then you'd put E. And I need to have oh, something a little different okay. there. Yes. Good, that, good, good thinking. Yeah. Uh, this is not the only way to do this problem. I want to do it a different way because doing it a different way will give you a sense of kind of expanding your, your repertoire of how to do these things. And it will also help you do a very, very hard problem whose solution I will sketch for you today, but whose machine I want you to actually do for homework. So I'll tell you how to do it, but you're going to have to take the idea and turn it into a machine. And it's based on another solution to this problem, which I think uses a slightly more uh, efficient use of the non-determinism. So let's do it. Different solution for this. The odd length is going to stay the same. That's just the way it was. Different way of doing this bottom half. Different idea. If we want something that's even length but isn't a palindrome, here's a halfway point. All we got to do to determine that is find a symbol here and a symbol here that mismatch, that are not the same. And the number of symbols from the left end here is the same as the number of symbols from the right end there. That's what a non-even length palindrome means. An even length non-palindrome. Everyone agree? Two symbols, this one the same from the left end, this one the same number from the right end, they mismatch. Mm -hmm. We did it this way by doing a lot of work. We actually you know, pushed on the first half, looked for the mismatch, checked for the halfway point, it's okay, but there's a nice, easier way to do it. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to read these symbols, pushing them on the stack as we go. And at some point, we are non-deterministically going to guess that this is the symbol right here that's going to be the mismatch. And we're going to remember it. And then we're just going to move across the tape, ignoring everything we see, until we non-deterministically guess that we're going to match it with this other symbol. If they mismatch, we're okay. How do we check that we made the right guess? Before we guess this, we push symbols on. We did that for a reason, because we counted how many steps it took to reach the cell. When we guess again later, we will then pop those symbols off as we read the symbols to the end to make sure that the number of slots between the big left end and this guy is the same as the number of slots between the right end and this guy. And we'll consider this a legitimate match or mismatch only when the pushing here matches the popping there. That avoids a lot of these inner loops that we were doing before. All right, if you don't get the idea yet, follow along as we build the machine. And then you'll see the machine right in front of you and we can, we can go through it in an example. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to read symbols zeros and ones and push them on the stack as we go. But we're not going to push the symbols themselves on the stack. We're just going to count. We're just going to count three or four symbols, as many as it takes. So here's what it looks like. Zero, any, x any, one, any, x any. This is different than before. We are not remembering the symbols. We're just counting how many steps it takes until we decide we're going to look at the symbol. 
Everybody get it? Not yet. Some people get it. Not everybody's there. Reading symbols, counting how many we've seen. At some point, we're going to non-deterministically go, stop reading symbols, look at this symbol, and remember what it is. Zero or one on anything. Leave the stack alone. Don't touch it. I saw a zero. I saw a one. Just like a finite state machine. We're remembering whether we saw a zero in that arrowed box or whether we saw a one. If we saw a zero, we're hoping to get a, a one later. If we saw a one, we're hoping to get a zero later. So this machine is going to work in parallel. We've remembered the state. We have something interesting about it. Okay, so if I saw a zero, now I continue to move along the string, completely ignoring what I see, not touching the stack, not doing anything, just marching along until some point I say, oh, I'm going to see another symbol, I'm going to see another symbol, oh, do 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 I'm going to see another symbol. Now I want to mismatch. I decided here's a one, I think this is the mismatching one. And then afterwards I'll check whether the number of symbols I counted here is the same as the number of symbols that are left. And if they are, that means I'm ready to accept. So, in this stage here, we look at zeros and we ignore them. We look at ones and we ignore them. And at some point, we decide, okie dokie, I see a one and that's a mismatch. One, any, any. And I'll call that mismatch. Here, it's the same thing, zero, any, any, one, any, any, zero, mismatch. So from this top way, if I get a one, I get a mismatch. From the bottom way, if I get a zero, I get a mismatch. And that mismatch can be guessed at any point. This is a very non-deterministic state because we can move along or we can decide to go here. Yeah, Blake. Uh, is there some reason restricting your stack alphabet to just being a counter? Because couldn't you just uh, push, if you see a zero, push the zero on the stack, or if you see a one, push the one on the I stack, and then match it up that way? And then, and then, and then uh, later on, choose if the input's a one, and stop the top of the stack is a zero, then up, or, or the other way around? I could do that, but I don't need to do that. That's more or less what we did last time, for the most part. If you did that, you wouldn't be able to just skip symbols here. It seems like it would just, it would just make the, the two middle states, the I saw a zero here? state and the I saw one state, the same state, mm -hmm. the I saw a zero would just be if the zero is on top of the stack. And the I saw a one state is if the one's on top of the stack. Oh, I see. I understand what you want to say. You want to read these things through it, it's and, the same thing. it's and the same leave it. Yeah, that's, you could do that. You could use the stack to hold it rather than the state to hold it. I understand what you mean. Sure, you could definitely do that. I just didn't think of that, but I did it this way. Yeah, you could definitely do that. Yeah. Good idea. The lower branch to I saw one that's supposed to be a one here. Thank you, Andrew. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. All right, so here we are. Now we made a guess, we get a mismatch. How do we check whether we're okay and we mismatch on the right symbols? At this point, zero any pop, one any pop. And if we hit the end, when the empty stack shows up, then we accept. This is the check that the two symbols we guessed we guessed here, and we guessed here, that those two guesses are the right relationship to one another. This is a really a different idea than the first way we did it. The first day we did it was a variation on the regular WW reverse, and this way makes use out of non-determinism in a way that encourages you to think of it as a higher level of guessing. You can guess things if you can kind of deterministically check that your guess was right. And that should remind you very much of that MP complete stuff we did, right? How long does it take? You make your guess for free, but then you have to deterministically check your guess. 
That's really what's going on here, too. Okay, questions about this? We're going to do a really, really hard problem now, and I won't write the machine for it, but I will sketch out the idea. It's a puzzle kind of a problem that I could give you and you could think about for a week and not get. Sometimes you might get it in an hour, but it's a hard problem, and I would never give it just straight on a homework all on its own. I think it's too tricky. But, but if I give you the idea, then you should be able to write the machine. And it's not just a puzzle out of nowhere. It's kind of a nice problem. Michael asked me before whether we could do WW. What was the answer? Can you do it with a non-deterministic push-down machine? I said you couldn't. I haven't proved it. We're going to prove it next class with pumpy lemmas and stuff. Do it with a Q. Uh, you could do it with a Q, I guess, huh? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so what does that tell you? Yeah, but then you couldn't do the... Oh, no? Well, maybe. <laughs> you sure? You can do a lot with a Q, right? I mean, here, here's a Q. Q's first in, first out. And, uh, and I want to use... And I want to actually do a stack, but all I got is a stupid Q, right? So every time... I want to uh, pop something off. It's not in the front, right? It's down in the back. So all I got to do is, is put something, you know, I, I put my little marker in the back of the queue, and I pop things off the queue. Ow, 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 ow. Oh, there's my marker. I just threw away the one I wanted. <laughs> no, but, <laughs> but I can save the one before. I can actually loop it around because I don't really want to lose them, right? Out they go and in back they go. Out they go, in the back they go. There's my marker. Come on, marker. Right in my pocket like a magician. And there's the one I wanted, the one that came out right before the marker. So I, I can do pushes and pops in a stack way on a queue. It just takes a lot of work. It's a big simulation. A single push and pop is a linear operation that takes time proportional to the number of things in your queue. But you can do it. You just pay for it. Uh, Blake, you had a question? Uh, no, I was just going to say that but you need the additional... I mean, yeah. Yeah. Right, you, that, but that's that's one state. That's okay, and you also need extra time. So anyway, uh, a Q can do one stack. Can it do two stacks? Well, you think about that. Can it do two stacks? Maybe. You can interleave the stacks. It can definitely do two stacks. Qs are very powerful, more powerful than you think. Especially how much tension stacks get. <laughs> Burning the candle on both ends? <laughs> you have a question? Well, I, I, I just okay. figured out how a Q can simulate stacks yet. Oh, it is important that you get it, but you don't have to get it right now. Right. <laughs> and you will get it probably by lunch. That's what some of you All right, let's, let's work on this. You can't do this with a non-deterministic push-down machine. We could work all day long and not be able to get it, and we will never get it. But what's really cool is that you can get its complement. And the reason I did the second way here is because how do we do the complement of WW reverse? The first way, we massage the way that we did WW reverse, right? We did its complement by... by by fiddling with the way we did the first one. Well, that's not going to be a good strategy here because we don't have any way to do WW. So we're completely on our own, and we need an idea that's completely unique. That's why we did this one in a different way, because at least this idea can build on that idea. Everybody okay so far? Getting tired. You're tired. Um, all right, let's think about this. We're going to think about it like a puzzle, not with any detailed machine written down. We're just going to write a picture on the board and think for a minute. If we mimic the idea here, what we'd like to do is make that same kind of a guess. A guess here and a guess here. But what's the condition that we want to check here? We want to check that the distance from the left end here, this distance, is the same as is the same as the distance from the middle to this one. So let me now suggest a bunch of bad ways to do this. We'll push symbols on the stack like we did before, remembering how many symbols it took to get here. And then we'll just randomly move along until we get to this guy and guess where the middle is. And then we'll start popping symbols and guess this one. And now all we have to do is check that we guess the right spot for the middle. 
But the way we guessed the right stop from the middle before was that we used our stack to remember all the symbols until we got to the middle. And I already used the stack for this thing. Well, I could use another stack and keep one stack to store this stuff and one stack to store my guess up until the middle, but that's two stacks. So this way really doesn't work. And it doesn't work in such a fundamental way that when you're working on this puzzle and you're first learning about theory, your gut instinct is that there's just no way to do this because it, it just really feels like you're stuck. It feels like there's no way you can even squeeze out anything to help you. Anything you do seems to need two stacks. Doesn't it seem that way? I mean, how are you going to show that anything from here to here is the same as something from the middle to here? without two guesses and two uh, checks on those guesses. It's really tricky. It's really a neat solution. It's, it's really hard to think of. What we want to do is make these two kind of checks that we're doing, you know, checking that this is equal to this and checking that this is equal to this. The reason it seems hard is because we have two equal numbers that we're trying to check that they're equal. The half to the second half and this first part to this first part. And we can't do that with one stack. You count one thing, you can check one thing. But you can't count two different things unless you're finished counting one when you're ready to start counting the other. But these are not nested, right? So that won't work. I mean, you can count one thing and then count something else, but that's not what's happening here. So can we make these two counting things that we have to check down to one? That's the trick. Can we interleave our, our counting? Every other thing that we push on the stack, one uses a uh, counting alphabet to count one of them, and a separate counting alphabet to count the other one, and interleave the symbols. So I example, don't think so, because because then when you're popping them off, what if you see something that doesn't apply to your count? You take it off, right. and then you find the one that does apply to your count. You take that off. Then you got to put that other one back on, right? How do you get it back on? I guess you could remember that you saw it. Where are you going to remember it? Yeah. You can remember it in a finite state. But you're limited in those finite states to a finite number. If you had another stack to put it in, you could do that. But that's where you get stuck. Good idea, but you get stuck. Joe, do you have an idea? Could you put more than one thing on a stack or in a, in a stack space? Sure. And then you could just put your first string first item of the stack space. Oh, I see. More than one thing in a particular symbol. Now, every stack, stack thing has one symbol. Okay. Right. And even if you could, you could do any finite number in one space, but you can't make a general thing go in one space. That's not allowed. All right. Uh, here's the best way for me to motivate this. Where's my big eraser? About halfway, oh, a little less. Check this out. That's good, right? Here's the first symbol in the string. This is meant to be halfway. This is the first symbol in the second half of the string. Everyone agree? If I move over one, then here's the second symbol in the first half. Here's the second symbol in the second half. What's true about these two symbols that I want to find the mismatch in? They're separated by half the total length. Right. They're separated by half the total length. Now, as simple as that is to see when I stick an eraser up on the board, or maybe not so simple. I didn't notice this for a few hours when I did this problem. That's the only thing you really have to check, is that these two things are separated by half the length of the total string. Now that's something that only requires a single counting. All you really want to do is make sure that the amount of the amount of distance here equals the amount of distance here plus here. Let's see if we can figure out a way to do that trick. Figure out a way to check that the amount of distance in between these two symbols has to be the same as the amount of distance between here and here. Now that Don has noticed this halfway idea, we can focus on that. I'll redraw the picture, and we'll think about it for a minute. Focus 
stack our return and we're all even large at the beginning. So that we have so we can do a negative. I'll make that color. We want the pink part to be equal to the blue part. And the part that we want to test on is this yellow part. Okay? And we want a unique time in the machine at which point we're going to guess this to look at this symbol, and at which point we're going to guess to mismatch at this symbol, just like we had in that machine. So these are going to be the guesses. And we want to make sure when we're all done that the number of symbols red in this pink area is equal to the number red in the blue area. So Chris had some idea that what should, the, what should we do in the blue area when we look at symbols? We want to do what? Push or pop? We should put, well, it doesn't really matter. We need to build our stack up with junk. Junk, okay. For a while, then stick a marker on it and start either counting up or down and then change direction in the pink part and then change direction again in the blue part. Change direction, you mean if you were pushing, you pop, and if you pop, you push? Right. All right, so let me, let me give a, a little bit of a cleaner way of doing that idea. That is the right idea. In this area, until we get to this spot, we're going to non-deterministically sit and push... Uh, push X's on a stack while we read symbols. And at some point, guess to look at this symbol, just like we do there. So I'll say push X's. Then we look at this symbol. And after this symbol, we're going to start looking at symbols, non-deterministically deciding when to mismatch. And if we're not going to mismatch and look at the symbol, what are we going to do as we move here? We're going to pop these symbols. So this area will be called pop X's. Now the popping of the X's may or may not go all the way through the pink section. It probably won't. The halfway point here is around this spot. Okay, and the popping of the X's, sorry, the, the popping of the X's may or may not finish before or after the halfway spot. It will finish right after this pink spot. So the red spot's the... Did I get it right? Not quite. Almost right. Push X's, pop X's. When this stack is empty, you start to push again. Call this, this section here. Push. And this is another random collection of symbols. It can be different from this. This might be three symbols and pop three symbols. This might be push four symbols. Okay, but I'll call it Y's just to show you that it's different from these X's. Then you make a guess, and then this section is pop the Y. We're hoping that this pops off the second we get to the end of the string. Let's say that happens. Let's say you push a bunch of symbols, pop a bunch of symbols, push a bunch of symbols, and pop a bunch of symbols, and you hit the end of the string the second you pop this last thing off and the stack's empty. What do you know? You know that 2X plus 2y plus 2, 2x plus 2y plus 1, 2, equals the whole string. Everyone agree? Mm -hmm. Yeah, done. Can you actually put your marker? Do you do a pop with that? These things, we won't do any pops or pushes. Okay. So we read 2x symbols, 2y symbols, and then these two symbols we read and didn't do anything with the stack. Here's the length of our string. The middle point is somewhere here, not necessarily in the center of this pink area, but somewhere left and right in there. We don't know exactly where it is. We're never going to find the halfway mark. We don't care about it. We only care that the distance between these two symbols is exactly equal to half the string or equal to the blue section. Well, what is that pink section? It's x plus y. The whole thing is x plus y, x plus y, plus the two symbols. So if this pink part is x plus y, then the blue part's also x plus y. 
This is really tricky, and it's very subtle. But here it is again. Push a bunch of symbols arbitrarily. Guess that you're choosing to look at a symbol. Pop those symbols off the stack. Now the stack's empty. Start pushing symbols again non-deterministically, guessing when to make a mismatch. Find a mismatch. At that point, pop the symbols that you have off the stack as you read the rest of your string. If your string empties out when your stack is empty, then you know that the middle part here, consisting of the popping of the first set and the pushing of the second set, was the same as the pushing of the first set and the popping of the second set. That they equal, not only are they the same, but they equal the length of the string. That means the middle section is half the length. That means they are separated by the right amount. The trick in this problem is not to focus on counting two things, but to focus on counting one thing. What we're really counting here is half the length of the string and making sure that these two things are separated by it. I want to give you this as an example, not to say, oh, look how hard these things can be, but more, here's a complicated idea. Show me how to do it with the machine. Even if you don't get this idea in detail, exactly why it works, you should be able to still simulate the pushes and the pops and the guessing by using this as a model and just mimicking this model and, and fiddling with it. And then if you don't get that, then ask me and I'll help you figure out how to do this. But this is one of the questions on your assignment three that you'll get next week. Yeah, question. Uh, I mean, obviously in a linear sense, this is up, down, up, down. It's not that big of a deal. But translating it into one of these, I don't really understand what you did with this previous machine well enough to translate that. I might. I might be able to do it. But it is a little bit confusing to me, um, I guess, some of the transitions you're making. Um, I guess how you know when you're doing what. Um, I, I mean, I realize that when you make one of these machines, you're defining a language, and so you don't have to know when you're doing what. But you didn't, I, I just sort of felt like well, you do have to know when you're doing what. It's just that it's non-deterministic. So if there's a lot of things this machine could do, and only right. one of them is going to get the right answer, right. presumably. Right, if you do the wrong thing, it's not in the language. But no, if, well, if you do the wrong thing, it dead. still may be in the language. You have to keep trying to try to do the right thing. If you can find one way to get to a final state, then that string's in the language. You can find 20,000 ways not to get there, and that doesn't mean it's not in the language. The only time it's not in the language is when all the ways you try don't get to a final state. Then it's not in the language. In non-determinism, something's not in the language if every single path that you try doesn't get you to a final state. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. You've got this union situation. I mean, I don't, maybe, I, maybe I just need to look at the... Um, you know, I think what, what you should do is look at this Think about it, and then I'll go with you through it on an exam. Maybe it's good for everybody to see an example maybe on this one. Should we do that and then quit today, do one more example? Here, let, let me tell you where we're headed with this before I just quit right off the bat. Uh, the next thing we need to do is I need to show you how, how any, how any uh, context-free grammar can get converted to one of these machines. Any context-free grammar can get converted to a non-deterministic machine. And I'll show you that next time. The other direction, that any machine can get converted to a grammar that's uglier and longer and harder, and I'm going to skip it. And I'll just leave it for reference in the book if you want to look at it. But it's true, and that thing's equivalent. I will do the one-way direction, and we'll need Chomsky normal form for going from grammars to machines. And it's not too long. That's about a half an hour of a lecture or so. But too much to do today after this detail. Uh, that comes next, and then pumping lemma after that, and then some issues about closure and decision algorithms about these things. So we, we got about two or three more lectures on this topic. Yeah, question? Back to the pumping a different pumping lemma, a new one, a new one. <laughs> it's better. <laughs> it's, it pumps twice. It's got biceps instead of just one big muscle in the middle. <laughs> yeah. A quick question about this. If, you, if you're comparing the first uh, symbol or the last symbol, does that mean you only have one transition of push and pop? If you can, oh, yes, yeah, so like, yes. If, if you want to... So like the first part of the hat, first string would then be like right on the middle, so it only transitions... Yeah, so, so Donna's got a good question. She's saying, what if these two symbols... <laughs> <laughs> what if these two symbols are at the beginning end of the string, where they could be? Right, I mean, it's completely possible that... Oh, no, they can't be. No, no, both like beginning and middle. Like, like here. What if they're... You mean if they're here and here? Yes. Well, Donna wants to know, what if the only two symbols that mismatch are the first symbol and the beginning of the middle? Or the last symbol before the middle and the last 
or that. In, in this situation, you don't push any symbols at all. And you don't pop any symbols at all. The whole thing is the Y section. This is all the Y. So and you're pushing this is and popping symbols, it's just not X's. You said you're pushing no symbols at all and popping You don't push any symbols for, the, for this first section. Oh, for the first section. Okay. For the first section, you don't push any symbols. Okay. Because you have a non-deterministic choice here every single time, whether you're going to push a symbol or whether you're going to read it. Okay. If you choose to read the first symbol and then move on to the next stage, mm -hmm. you don't end up pushing anything at that stage. Okay. And the popping ends up popping nothing. You're, and you end up making a lucky guess, and you just check that this half equals that half. And vice versa, if you do it the other way, then you push everything the first stage, and there's no Ys to push. So if it's the first symbol, but you're still going to start pushing first, because you have to, there's nothing there. No, you you're don't. Pushing Ys. You're pushing Ys, but you're pushing something. He's saying right. you're pushing no symbols. Right. And I you know, know, I write, I, I say here pushing Xs and, and popping Xs and pushing Ys and popping Ys. You actually can use the same symbol. It's just that you're likely going to push and pop different numbers of these symbols. That's why I use the different... I didn't mean different symbols you're pushing. You could use different symbols, but you don't need to. You just are going to push the same symbol different a number of times. You get it. All right. I think it might be worthwhile to do this for a second. Erase my pretty color picture and do an actual computation of this machine on a non-even length palindrome just to show how the computation works. Okay? We do that and then we'll... Then we'll call it a day. Uh, you mean an odd palindrome? No. Well, no. Possibly, but a non palindrome. Here are two strings. This string really is an even length palindrome. Okay. Right? This string is not an even length palindrome. This machine should not be able to accept this. This machine should be able to accept this. So. First, let's try to see if we can find a way for this machine to accept this. Not every way is going to work. Let's see, because you know how this machine is supposed to work, whether you can make the right choice without having to guess. So, right at the beginning, you want to go down here or here? No. If you go up here, you will not accept. That's a bad choice. It's not odd length. So go down here. Now we see a zero. Do you want to push that zero, or do you want to say, I saw a zero move to this stage? Picking, you say, I saw a zero move to this stage, means you're hoping that these two mismatch. They don't mismatch. So you better not go there. I'm going to use some color here, if I can. Use red. We haven't used red today. I'm going to write in red what we actually do. We go here. We go here. Now, I've seen the zero, and I stored it on the stack. The stack now has an X in it. Now we see this one. What do you want to do? Don't go through again because that one is the mismatch and it's the only mismatch. If you don't go down now, you're dead. You'll never make it to the final state. And now we see a zero. What should I do? Just ignore it. Read through it. And now I see another zero. What should I do? Ignore. Ignore it. And now I see this zero. That's the one I want to mismatch. And now I'm hoping to God that I got exactly one thing left in my stack. I see it. I pop it, it's gone, and now i got no more symbols left, so I can go over here. There's no other computation that would have gotten to a final state here. There are other strings that there were more than one that can get to the end. If there are more than one mismatch, there's lots of ways to get there. But there only has to be one to accept the string. And in this string, in this string, there are no ways. Try anything you want from here. Make any guesses you want. Try any of the arrows that are legitimately there. You will never get this string to make this machine end you up in here. And therefore, we reject this string. Okay, and that's worth expressing.